Great. So hello, I am Hillary Foote, the Farm and Forest Land Use Specialist for the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development, or DLCD. So this presentation today is going to be very briefly reviewing the purpose, history, and some of the fundamental components of the regulatory structure that underlies Oregon's zoning-based farmland conservation program that implements statewide planning goal three. So this presentation is being provided today specifically to help provide some additional background context for the Farm and Forest Conservation Program Improvements Project, which DLCD initiated in August of 2024. But my hope is that it will also be useful to a broader audience. For this presentation today, I am assuming the viewer already has a basic understanding of Oregon's land use planning program. But if that's not the case, there are a variety of resources available on DLCD's website, particularly under the Oregon planning tab, that go over the general structure and various components of Oregon's planning program in general. And because we're only going to talk uh, touch on these topics briefly today, I want to make the viewer aware of two documents that uh, address aspects of the Farm and Forest Program in much greater detail than we'll be covering today. So the first is the Biennial Farm and Forest Land Use Report that DLCD provides to the legislature. The Biennial Farm and Forest Report looks at trends in conversion of resource lands to other uses through zone changes urban growth boundary expansions, and through allowable non-farm or non-forest development approvals. Um, the second resource is the recently published Technical Working Group Summary Report that attempts to identify and explain a number of technical issues with the farm and forest program, as well as a variety of potential solutions to address those issues. So both of those reports are available on DLCD's website at the links that are shown here. For today, we're going to start off with some historical context. So one thing that is very important to understand about the agricultural program and exclusive farm use zoning that implements it is that exclusive farm use zoning predates the land use planning program by over a decade, and that it has always been associated with a tax program. Exclusive farm use zoning was originally standardized across the state in 1963 as part of an incentive tax program that went something like this. If you were a farmer, you could voluntarily ask to have restrictive exclusive farm use zoning applied to your land, and in exchange, your property would be assessed at its farm value rather than its value for development. And that would save you a lot of money. This type of farmland protection tool was implemented in a number of states across the US during the 1950s and 1960s as a state-initiated policy reaction to an alarming loss of prime farmland that occurred following World War II. So after that war, the factory processes that were established to support the war effort were applied to development of housing and personal automobiles, which along with some other significant developments, set the stage for the rapid growth of suburbs. Because settlers tended to establish cities in locations where it was easy to grow food, cities also tend to be located on high quality farmland. So as cities expanded, the result was a loss of a significant amount of arable soil to urbanization and sprawl. So Oregon was one of a number of states during that era that created an incentive tax program to try to conserve farmland. The 1960s incentive tax program in Oregon was popular, but it didn't accomplish what the state had hoped it would. 
uh, particularly in the Willamette Valley, which has some of the most fertile soils in the world, rapid sprawl and urbanization continued to occur. The graph here illustrates how between 1955 and 1970, over half a million acres of farmland in the Willamette Valley were converted to urban development. So in that same period during the 1960s, Clackamas lost a third of its farmland. And this alarming rate of conversion, particularly in the Willamette Valley in Oregon, spurred certain farmers to become farmland protection activists. Hector McPherson is probably the best known of this group who provided critical advocacy for the passage of Senate Bill 100. Senate Bill 100 is Oregon's landmark land use planning bill, as well as its lesser known partner bill, Senate Bill 101, the Agricultural Lands Bill. While Senate Bill 100 created the land use planning program that we know today, Senate Bill 101 overhauled the exclusive farm use zone statutes and together with Senate Bill 100 resulted in some fundamental changes to the farmland conservation program. In 1973, the farmland conservation program became mandatory with compensatory benefits rather than an incentive tax program. So counties were required to inventory agricultural lands. They were required to identify them on a map and to protect them with exclusive farm use zoning. The associated tax program then became part of a suite of compensatory benefits that were conferred on landowners in exchange for restrictive zoning that limited the use of those properties. And the rationale for that change was very arti clearly articulated by the legislature in the legislative policy on the preservation of agricultural lands that is codified in state statute at ORS 215-243. This is a lot of words to put on a slide. Um, the agricultural land use policy statement that's set out here was enacted and codified before statewide planning goal three, the agricultural lands goal was adopted. And goal three references this legislative policy statement. Um, and although that statement merits more consideration in my opinion than we have time for here today, there are three things uh, here that I, I wanna point out is particularly important. One, this policy recognizes that the agricultural economy is dependent on a finite land resource. It is an important economic sector to the state of Oregon that is locationally dependent on good dirt, on arable land and on rangeland. The second important point here is that the policy recognizes that the agricultural sector is important to the state, not just to the state's economy, which it certainly is, but agricultural lands are also important to the health and well being of our communities in general. There is definitely a nod here to the importance of food security and food sovereignty. And thirdly, this policy recognizes that the preservation of the agricultural land base is so important that the mandatory restrictive zoning program, which limits alternative uses of farmland, is merited, as well as that suite of compensatory benefits that go along with those restrictions. Um, so before we move on from, from this policy statement, I want to just touch briefly on planning goal two and the exceptions process. The statewide land use planning program isn't absolute, and Planning Goal 2 contemplates that there may be unique or exceptional situations in which the policies of the statewide planning goals are appropriately waived. 
So when we are reviewing an exception to statewide planning goal three, it is because there's something so important or unique about that property or the project proposal that it merits waiving the principles that are articulated uh, in this agricultural lands policy. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna go over some of the structure of the program that implements the agricultural lands policy in goal three. And we're gonna start with the basic definition of agricultural land that needs to be protected. There is a detailed definition in DLCD's administrative rules and in goal three itself for those lands that are to be inventoried by counties and protected under exclusive farm use zoning. And that definition has four components. The first and the foundational component of this definition is based on dirt. It is based on the soil capability classification assigned to a mapped soil unit by the U.S. Department of Agricultural Natural Resource Conservation Service, which I will be referring to as NRCS. The NRCS soil capability classification is a clear, objective, scientific metric that is about the land itself. And this is very important. This component of the definition is agnostic to an individual farm operator's practices, their business savvy, or trends in the agricultural markets. It's about soil. NRCS soil capability classification is indicative of a particular soil's ability in a general way to produce most kinds of field crops, with class one being great for most kind of crops and a higher number indicating progressively more limitations for growing crops. You will find that these NRCS capability classifications are referenced throughout DLCD's rules in a few different contexts, including in the definition of high value farmland and in tests for non-farm dwellings, both of which we'll talk about in a bit. So if land is predominantly composed of soils with a capability class uh, rating of one to four in Western Oregon or one to six in Eastern Oregon, it is defined as agricultural land, end of story. So just as a visual example, the aerial photo in the lower right of the slide shows a property that's zoned for exclusive farm use, and it has the NRCS soils map units overlaid on it. So those soil units shown in white at the bottom of the aerial photo are fat, flat pasture areas located on a valley bottom. And these soil units in the white, in the lower of the photo, uh, have a capability class of two, which makes them very productive. The soil units shown in red and blue are on steep wooded slopes that have lower farm capability classifications, though they do have very high vegetative productivity ratings for timber. So this particular property is primarily composed of class two soils as mapped in white, and it is defined as agricultural land. All right, so beyond soils, a county is also able to identify more land of lesser capability classes as agricultural land under three cases. One, if that land is suitable for farm use, so suitability of land um, is related to factors that are, are unique to that property, like topography or its position within an agricultural landscape. The second is if that land is necessary to permit farm practices on adjacent lands or on that property itself. An example of that might be um, in an area like Tillamook County where there is a high concentration of dairy operations and land of a lower capability class near a dairy may be needed, for example, to spread manure during the wet season. And lastly, if that land is intermingled with land of a higher capability class, 
it is considered agricultural land. So in this last example, depending on where you are in the state, it's not uncommon to find pockets of lower capability soils or rock outcroppings interspersed in a more productive landscape. Okay. So that is how we define agricultural land in Oregon. And under agricultural lands, there are a subset of lands that are considered high value for land. The Oregon Land Conservation and Development Commission, or LCDC, has the authority to limit or disallow certain uses on high value farmland. In the technical working group summary report I mentioned earlier, there is an appendix that lists the uses that LCDC has chosen to prohibit or limit on high value farmland to date. The commission also has the ability to add to the definition of high value farmland in rule. There are currently two definitions of high value farmland in statute. One is at ORS 215.710. It is the original definition. And the other is at ORS 195.300. The definition at ORS 215.710 is primarily soils based uh, and it contains two regionally specific definitions, one for the Willamette Valley and another for coastal dairies. The ORS 195-300 definition is a newer definition, which incorporates the older definition at 215-710 and then expands upon it to include a definition LCDC adopted by rule for an important agricultural area on the southern coast. Um, it also includes suitability for viticulture, and it also looks at access to irrigation water. The definition at ORS 195-300 is a newer definition. It was actually created for Measure 49 in 2009. And this newer definition is the one that's been applied to new uses, pilot projects, and significant rule changes that have been either enacted or adopted since 2009. So it's important to note that there are two different definitions for high value farmland in the state of Oregon that are used in land use planning. So by now we have a pretty good sense that soils data plays an important role in the Goal 3 program in the Agricultural Lands Program. Soils data is primarily used to identify agricultural lands to be protected under statewide planning goal three. It is also used to identify high value farmland as a subset of those agricultural lands. And it is also used to categorize farmland for some other uses like solar development um, and non-farm dwellings. And it's also used in certain processes like urban growth boundary expansion. There is statutory language at ORS 215.211 that directed DLCD to set up a program that allows a landowner to contract a site-specific soils assessment that is more detailed than an RCS soils mapping. We call this the Soils Challenge Program. And under the Soils Challenge Program, a property owner may hire a soils professional who has certain required credentials and has been approved by DLCD. Um, that soils professional will visit the site, take samples, and produce an order one soils report containing certain information that's required by DLCD's rules. That soils report is submitted to DLCD to review for completeness. DLC does not review it for technical soundness. We don't have the internal capability to do that. Um, we do review it for completeness though. And when we approve a report to be released to a county, a county then uses that report as evidence in a land use proceeding if they choose to do so. 
for these site-specific order one sales reports, it's typical to see um, a report that moves the boundary of a map sales unit on a property or reports that identify, for example, the presence of a soils unit that's common to the area that hadn't been mapped on the property. It is also um, more common to see soils reports that also identify areas of human altered terrain or human transported materials as new lower capability areas on a property. And this is often things like um, driveways, areas of old home sites, um, cattle lanes, or wetlands that have been filled. So these site-specific soil challenges are, uh, can be used in land use proceedings to assist a county in determining whether land meets the definition of agricultural lands. They cannot be used to challenge um, categorization as high value farmland. Site-specific soils challenges are typically used when a property is being rezoned to another rural use because it does not meet the definition of agricultural lands. In these cases, the site-specific soils challenge um, may be used to address that first component of the definition of agricultural lands. The county still needs to address those other three components of the definition. Site-specific soil challenges are also used and non-farm dwelling reviews. There has been some debate since the soils program was created in 2011 as to whether this option could be used for non-farm dwellings or not. So I just want to point out here that more soils challenges have been used to support non-farm dwelling approvals than have been used for zone changes. So that's shown uh, in this pie chart on the slide on the right hand side. And we'll discuss non-farm dwellings in, in just a moment. All right, so now we're going to touch on some of the types of dwellings and non-farm uses that can be permitted on land that's protected under exclusive farm use zoning. And we're gonna start with dwellings. A lot of people are, are surprised to learn that they're actually quite a number of different types of dwellings that can be approved on farmland. And there are a variety of available tests to permit many of these dwelling types. Generally, dwellings that are permissible on farmland can be divided into two groups, dwellings that are in conjunction with a farm operation and dwellings that aren't associated with any farm operation. Dwellings in conjunction with a farm operation are essentially workforce housing that is provided to support agricultural operations. And most of these dwelling types require a demonstration that there is a bona fide farm operation on that property or on that farm tract. In addition to agricultural workforce housing, there are also several opportunities in exclusive farm use zones or dwellings that aren't provided in association with a farm operation. There are a lot of record dwellings for people who purchased land before 1986, perhaps with the expectation of being able to place the dwelling on the property. Health hardship dwellings for a caregiver, which is temporary and must be removed at the end of the hardship. Uh, Non-farm dwellings, which we will discuss in a moment, and replacement dwellings, which may or may not be associated with the farm operation. So a quick word on replacement dwellings. So you note on the pie chart at the bottom of the slide here, in blue, non-replacement uh, dwellings represent the largest category of dwellings approved on farmland since 1994. Replacement dwellings were added as a use in 1993, and in the 90s and in the early 2000s, for the most part, involved the replacement of dwellings that were built prior to the implementation of the land use planning program. So what we are seeing now in uh, the 2020s is that more dwellings are being replaced that were permitted 
after the implementation of the land use planning program. And now we're seeing dwellings that were permitted after the enactment of House Bill 3661 in 1993. And House Bill 3661 was a, a pivotal bill um, that did a lot of things, um, but for for this conversation, it established most of the resource dwelling types and tests that we have on farm and forest lands, like template test dwellings, a lot of record dwellings, and non-farm dwellings. So what we're seeing now um, are requests to replace dwellings that were permitted under very, very, very specific permit conditions. And there is some ambiguity as to how those original approval conditions should apply to a replacement dwelling. The other thing I want to point out about this pie chart is that all of the dwelling types in conjunction with farm use, which are shown in green and yellow, collectively represent just 22% of dwellings approved in exclusive farm use zones since 1994. More non-farm dwellings, which are shown in orange, have been approved in exclusive farm use zones than farm worker housing. And that is a very good segue into our conversation on non-farm dwellings. Non-farm oh. non dwellings have been a topic of discussion and of controversy since they were added to the exclusive farm use zone in 1973. So Hector McPherson, who we mentioned earlier, um, was one of the principal sponsors of uh, Senate Bill 101 and Senate Bill 100. Um, and in 1970s, he stated that the purpose of non-farm dwellings was not to, quote, open the exclusive farm use zone up to subdivisions, but rather to provide a little scape valve here whereby we can allow a small amount of single family residential dwellings within an exclusive farm use zone. However, as we just seen, non-farm dwellings represent nearly a quarter of all dwelling approvals in, in farm zones and constitute more dwelling approvals than uh, those dwellings in conjunction with farm use or those farm worker housing. The criteria for non-farm dwellings are notoriously complex and subjective. There are nine different test options for non-farm dwellings across the state, with different options for marginal land counties, for the Willamette Valley, for Eastern Oregon, and for Western Oregon. Um, but outside of marginal land counties, which are Lane and Washington, there are three basic comments to the review, and there's gonna be some, some variation depending where you are in the state. There is an impacts test, a suitability test, and a material stability test. So the impacts test requires a county to find that the non-farm dwelling and activities associated with the non-farm dwelling will not force a significant change or significantly increase the cost of accepted farming or forest practices on nearby land. And this is very similar to the farm impacts test that we'll talk about for conditional uses in just a moment. The second component of a non-farm dwelling review is a suitability test. And again, there are slightly different standards for this assessment in areas outside of the Willamette Valley. Outside of the Willamette Valley, a county must essentially find that a portion of the property for the non-farm dwelling um, is not suitable for the production of farm crops or livestock or merchantable tree species, considering the terrain, adverse soil, or land conditions like drainage and flooding, um, vegetation, um, or the size of the tract. DLCD's rules clarify that land comprised of certain capability class soils is presumed to be suitable. And there's a, a lot of debate around that. And that's where those soil challenges we talked about earlier come into this review. In the Willamette Valley, the requirement is, is more objective. 
and it's based on soil capability classifications only. The last component of the test is the, the most controversial. It's uh, uh, called a material stability test. And this is very complicated. It essentially requires the county to consider the cumulative impact of all existing and all potential dwellings not in conjunction with farm use and non-farm parcels within a 1,000 to 2,000 plus acre study area. And in considering all of the past and potential dwellings to determine if the stability of the prevailing land use pattern will be altered. So a county must deny an application if the county determines that the potential dwelling will make it more difficult for types of farms in the area to continue operation due to diminished opportunities to expand, purchase or lease farmland, acquire water rights, or diminish the number of tracts or acreage and farm use in a manner that destabilizes the character of the study area. Um, a particular challenge with this type of review is determining when the jurisdiction has encountered that proverbial tipping point for a given area, particularly when you're evaluating something as dynamic as an agricultural landscape. Um, and these complex reviews can often require more time and resources you know, from a county than might be covered by a standard application fee, just going through all of the records to determine how existing dwellings had been permitted. Um, it's quite a lot of time and effort. Um, it has also been suggested that the complexity of this review, um, particularly when the review also involves a site-specific soils challenge, limits the opportunity for non-farm dwelling to those wealthier applicants who can afford to hire a land use professional or attorney to prepare such a complex application, as well as the soils professional to challenge the NRCS soils mapping. And um, so that is non-farm dwellings in a nutshell. So I'm now gonna move on to non-farm uses as they have been permitted um, in zones reserved for farm use. So as we discussed earlier, exclusive farm use zones are meant to be restrictive. They're meant to limit use of agricultural land to farm operations. And those non-farm uses that have been allowed by the legislature. So chapter 215 of statute is where exclusive farm use zoning lives and it contains a detailed definition of what farm use is, followed by a list of allowable non-farm uses. So this is very important. These uses are established by the legislature. They're not established by LCDC or counties. When exclusive farm use zoning was established in 1963, there were six uses that were allowed in exclusive farm use zones. They rarely were restrictive and limited. Since that time, the legislature has added uses almost every section, and there are now over 60 uses that are listed in statute in chapter 215 as allowable in exclusive farm use zones. And those uses are divided into two buckets, really. The first bucket are sub one uses or type one uses, are uses that the legislature finds to be compatible with farm and forest uses. The second bucket or sub two uses type two uses are uses that the legislature determined may possibly be compatible with farm and forest uses depending on the circumstances of the request. And for type two uses, counties review these through a public process and have to find that the proposal won't significantly impact farm practices or the cost of farm and forest practices in the surrounding areas part of that review. 
The subjective test associated with those type two uses is referred to as the farm impacts test. It's also referred to, you know, by its um, statutory reference, ORS 215-296. There is a very well-known uh, case law standard established by Brett Marverson Jackson that delves into the legislative intent behind the two buckets and essentially says that counties must allow sub one uses as the legislature has described them and they cannot be more restrictive. Um, I would just add as the legislature has described them or as interpreted or clarified by LCDC and DLCD's rules. For sub two uses, counties may choose to allow these uses or not, and they may adopt more restrictive standards than are in statute or rule if they choose to do so. The last topic we want to touch on today is going to involve um, a couple of these sub two uses as well as uh, some of the sub one uses that are listed here. And particularly um, two sub two uses that have been controversial over the years, home occupations, and commercial activities in conjunction with farm use. So these are specifically listed uses in chapter 215. The graph at the bottom of this slide shows the top five most commonly approved non-farm uses and exclusive farm use zones since 2008. Home occupations are shown in yellow and commercial activities in conjunction with farm use are shown in turquoise. These are uses that are fairly vaguely defined in chapter 215 of statute and a wide variety of uses um, and intensity of uses are, are permitted under these categories. Uh, they range from you know, equipment repair facilities and mechanic shops to events venues, to hair salons, to firearm dealers. And these two uses, particularly because they are kind of catch-all uses, are implicated in something that we, we like to call multi-path permitting. So sometimes a proposal, an applicant might come to a county with a proposal, might be permitted in a variety of ways. And the distinction between those various options can be very subtle or sometimes unclear. So to illustrate this concept, Let's use this example. Say I'm a county planner discussing a proposal with a potential applicant involving the sale and tasting of cider. There are a number of ways that might be permitted depending on the intensity and frequency of the tastings and uh, whether or not they're associated with a farm operation, whether you know the, the cider was produced um, using apples grown on site. That cider sales and tasting proposals might be permitted, for example, as a one-time temporary event, or it might be permitted as part of a farm stand, which is a sub one use in chapter 215 that has a lot of standards associated with it. That might, that cider tasting might be permitted as an agritourism or other commercial events permit, um, which allows up to 18 events per year. It might be permitted as a cider business, which is a standalone sub one use in chapter 215, which was added fairly recently and also has a number of standards associated with it. Or it might be permitted under one of the catch-all buckets as a home occupation or as a commercial activity in conjunction with farm use or CAC food. So it's not uncommon for proposals that cannot meet the standards defined for a specific use in statute or rule, like a cider business or an agritourism event, to seek approval under the broader catch-all home occupations or commercial activities in conjunction with farm use provisions. So this can become even more confusing when multiple permits have been issued 
for activities on a single property, say a farm sand permit for the sale of agricultural products and events, and a processing permit to produce value added products, and a home occupation approval for the sale of items that are allowed at the farm stand, or for events that would exceed the revenue threshold of the uh, of events allowed uh, at a farm stand. So it can be challenging for both planners and an applicant confusing to navigate the variety of permitting pathways and establish which one is appropriate for the use at the permitting phase. And then as that business maybe grows and becomes more successful over time, um, there can be enforcement issues that come up as additional permits may be needed for for a particular use that exceeds approved standards. So we've now spent about 45 minutes covering some of the basic sort of components of goal three and the, the regulatory structure that implements goal three. Uh, we've gone over things very quickly, very briefly. So again, I would refer folks to the biennial farm and forest report to the legislature um, for a little bit more background information on some of the topics that we covered today, or to the technical working group's report for the Farm and Forest Land Use Conservation Improvements Project. Both of these are available on our webpage. If one of these topics particularly caught your attention today and you have questions about it, please feel free also to reach out to me. Um, I can be reached by email at hillary.foot at dlcd.oregon.gov. And I'm always more than happy to um, talk to people about goal three or goal three and the rules and statutes that implement them. So thank you for your time and your interest. We look forward to working with you in the future.